So a few years ago, I got pink eye. Anybody else ever had pink eye? It's a miserable thing, isn't it? Well, two of us have had it, apparently. So, okay, thank you, thank you. I had it, and I had a terrible case of it. I think I got it from one of my grandkids. I'd never had it before in all my life. Here I am with pink eye, and uh, it's bad enough for most people. For those of us that wear corrective lenses, I've got contacts, and uh, man, I'm, I'm telling you, that was impossible to wear when you've got pink eye. Wore glasses for a couple of weeks, just miserable. I can't see as well with the glasses when I have those on, and uh, you know, I still have like flashbacks of people calling me nerd when I was in second grade. So I don't wear them very often. Okay, so I've got pink eye and uh, I go to bed one night and, you know, my eyes are, you know, get matted shut. I'd wake up every morning and, you know, I'd have to kind of make my way to the bathroom, clean out my eyes really good. Well, this one particular night, I woke up suddenly because I had a cramp in my leg. It's what happens when you get old. It just happens all of a sudden. There's nothing, you know, you, can, it, you can't predict it. You just wake up. And I immediately roll to the side to get out of bed. I step up. And it's about that time that I get up that I realize that I can't see either because my eyes are matted shut. And I'm trying to hobble on one leg while the other one's cramped up. Eyes, you know, matted shut, trying to make my way to the bathroom, stumbling over everything literally uh, trying to get there and blinded because of this uh, pink eye that I've got. Um, some of you know what that's like. Some of you had struggled with your vision for some reason. I've got friends legally blind that cannot see. It is a constant struggle for them uh, just to do life, right? So would you consider, while we're talking this morning, would you consider that it's possible that you have been somewhat blind? Not physically blind, that's not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, would you consider the possibility that you have lived for a while spiritually blinded? Would you just think about that? Open the door up that that might be a possibility for you. Welcome back to our series we're calling Ordinary. It's from the book of Acts, and we're in Acts chapter 6 and 7 today. So if you have your Bible with you, please, please, please open that up, Acts chapter 6. If you've got it on a phone, that's great. Pull the app up, get there. We're going to follow along with it. I'll have it on the screen if you don't have that, but hopefully next week when you come, make sure you bring that. That's just a, a big a part of our, our services is us pulling out our own Bibles and looking at it, you being able to go back. In fact, today I'm going to be taking a big chunk of Scripture and we are going to narrow it way down, right? I'm going to cover lots and lots of verses in about 30 seconds, okay? And what I'm hoping is that you're going to go back and you're going to read it and kind of be familiar with it and I'm going to just highlight it for you and you're going to be interested enough to go back and, and to see what that is. So Acts chapter 6, this is somewhat again, one of those sacred texts. This is a situation where we are going to read today the record of someone for the very first time dying because of their obedience to Jesus, okay? We're going to see this story of a man named Stephen who actually is going to become the first Christian martyr. He's going to die because he believes and he obeys Jesus. And we've seen this escalation through the story as we've been reading through, through Acts. By the way, it's the story of the early church. It's the story after Jesus came to the earth, died, rose from the grave, and told his followers to make disciples of all nations. This is the story that we're reading. And so we, we've read this intensely growing. Chapter 4, it was a warning to Peter and John, quit speaking in the name of Jesus. We got to chapter 5, all the apostles get flogged because of it. And now we're gonna, when we get to chapter 6 and 7, somebody's going to die because of it. And he's not going to die just because he believed. He's going to die because he was being obedient and being a witness. Okay, we're going to pick it up. We, we covered the first seven chapters last week. We're going to pick up the story, Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. 
Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called. And it says, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. A couple of things that are familiar if you were here last week. First of all, the man Stephen, we talked about him. He was one of the seven, right? One of the seven that kind of uh, kind of stood up and began to do some things. One of the seven that was chosen. And so uh, apparently he's from this Hellenistic synagogue. We read that the synagogue of the freedmen. That's the same one we were talking about early on in chapter 6. This is Greek-speaking Jews, right? Stephen's a part of that. Apparently now uh, people are beginning to talk against him. Stephen is not just ordinarily good, not just skilled, we're told that he has some wisdom that the Spirit gave him. In fact, when you think about his full resume here, think about some of the things that we have talked about uh, full of God's grace and power. We just read it in verse 8. If we were to go back to verse 3, we're we're told that he was full of grace and wisdom or full of the Spirit and wisdom. Uh, Verse 5 said he was full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And so what you've got here is a combination, somebody who is not afraid. This man is full of faith. He's got the Holy Spirit in him. He's a wise person. He's not afraid. We're going to see his faith is going to preside over fear in his life. Look at some of the things that are going to happen. Let's pick it up in verse 11. They secretly persuaded. This is the, the Jewish leaders of this synagogue. They persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. That's pretty bad stuff for good Jewish people, right? So it goes on. It says, so they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law, and they seized Stephen, and they brought him before the Sanhedrin. So they've got things that are kind of moving. They are going to get Stephen. They are upset that he is talking about Jesus, that he is caring for people in the name of Jesus, right, taking care of widows. People began to talk, you know, and and gossip about him, saying he's doing things that would be offensive to the Jewish people. And so they're calling him before the official ruling council, the Sanhedrin, right? That was the big deal. Look what happens in chapter 7, verse 1. By the way, just same story, right? They just put a place in there to help us figure out where it is. It says, the high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? Can we just point out here that, once again, the Holy Spirit, using just regular people and sometimes even people that aren't even believers, the Holy Spirit is opening a door and providing an audience, an audience for believers to be able to share their witness. Stephen, are these charges true? In other words, Stephen, would you like to take the podium right now, and would you like to share what you believe? And Stephen absolutely does. He stands up, he begins to speak, and you will read now for almost an entire chapter, this man just speaking the Word of God. In fact, this is the longest speech, the longest sermon, the longest witness that we will read in the book of Acts. This, this, this guy is just going to nail it. In fact, as you read through his message, it is almost like an Old Testament history class. He is going to take the, the Jewish people and he is going to walk through the major events that they are going to call significant stuff for their, for their beliefs. It's got Abraham in it. It's got Moses in it. It's got Joseph in it. But it's not just a history lesson. Make sure you understand that everything that Stephen is talking about is talking about Jesus. It's all pointing to Jesus. Even though he doesn't mention Jesus till way at the end of his, of his message right here, everything here is going to be about Jesus and pointing him. Moses, J- Abraham, Joseph. We, we just spent an entire year uh, in 2022 talking through, teaching through Genesis, right? And we talked about how everything points to Jesus. Joseph's life is a type of Jesus. Abraham, he says, I'm going to be, uh, God says to him, I'm going to bless the nations because of you. It's all pointing to Jesus. And so everything here is doing that very same thing. In fact, 
uh, Stephen's going to mention, many of the prophets that you respect, your ancestors rejected them. And so you considering Jesus a black sheep is like affirming that he's on the, he's on the right side. He's on God's side. You, you rejected all the prophets that spoke about him. And so if he comes and you reject him too, it just affirms that he is God's man. You treated him the same way. Now, again, I'm going to skip everything. That, that's, that's my summation of what Stephen's going to say. You've got to go back and read it. And you are going to read some harsh words to people that uh, share some of the history. Share some. These are friends of Stephen as he, as he says these things to him. He's recalling to them their history and, and how it points to Jesus. But look what he does when he gets to the very end. Verse 48, he's going to wrap kind of his message up. And look what he does in his closing remarks. However, the Most High, that's God, does not live in houses made by human hands. See, what he's doing now is he is referencing specifically the temple. And they are mad at Stephen because you are blaspheming God, you are blaspheming Moses, you are blaspheming the temple. It was a big deal to them. That was the, the pinnacle of their place of worship. He does, not, he does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. God's not contained by places, by buildings. In fact, he goes on, the prophet goes on and says, How will, what kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all of these things? You can't restrict God to a house, to a place, to a building, to a location, to a city. And they were doing all the above. Jerusalem, the holy city, the temple, the holy place of God, all of those things. In fact, when he says a house made by hands, it's basically the same terminology of what in the Old Testament they would call worship of idols. You made something with your hand and you're worshiping it. And becomes a representation. What, what you make for them became a place that, that they worshipped instead of God himself. It was a form of idolatry. And there's still kind of that tendency for people to, to substitute a man-made institution for a relationship with the living God. And so Isaiah, who we just quoted from right there, Stephen just quoted from, if the universe is God's handiwork, how can he be contained? How can you just put him in a box? How can you just put him in this little building? How can you just restrict God that way? So here's one of the themes that we're talking about today. It goes back to that whole idea of being spiritually blinded, right? If you're taking notes, this is a good time to write them down. One of the themes that we're talking about is when you're spiritually blinded, one of the things you do is you restrict God. You confine God. You restrain God. Not that we can, but in our minds, that's what we do. We restrict him. He can't do that. He, he, he's not capable of that. And so you've got these Jewish people so worried about the temple. And Stephen's reminded them, God is not tied down to a place. In fact, what's interesting is that for those that he mentioned, the big ones in this sermon, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Moses, their major life work was nowhere around the temple and nowhere around Jerusalem. God doesn't get confined to that, to that place. God revealed himself to Abraham in Mesopotamia. It was nowhere near Jerusalem and the temple. When God came to Moses, it was out in the wilderness. It was down uh, in a place that was far away, down by Mount Sinai. His act of obedience for his people was set in Egypt. It, it, here we, this is a completely foreign land. So none of this stuff was placed. In fact, the, the original tabernacle, it was designed as a place where, where, where God's presence moved with the people. It was intentionally mobile. It symbolized God's movement with his, with his people. And so the message that Stephen's given right here is God is not contained to a building or to a location or to a place, which is more than just giving a message to these Jewish people about how God works. What Stephen is doing is almost foreshadowing for us that the gospel is going to reach new places. It's not going to stay right here in Jerusalem. 
It's going to move beyond this place. Get ready because God is on the move. And we'll see it in the very next chapter. Chapter 8 is when things begin to, to move and the gospel begins to expand. And Stephen, it's almost like he's setting it up. This is not just going to be something that happens here. God is not contained to this place. When you're spiritually blinded, you restrict God. You, re you confine him to the things that you think are possible for an almighty God. And we have to be careful we don't do the same thing. Is it possible that for whatever reason you're blinded to the fact that causes you to restrict God in some way. Well, God, God doesn't do things like that anymore. God, God can't make those kinds of things happen. Maybe you've thought, God can't forgive the things that I've done or the things that that other person has done. They're so far away. It, it, they are so removed. God doesn't do that. God doesn't help in those kinds of situations. Maybe you've got your own version of spiritual blindness that has caused you to restrict what God can do. And we, we've got to be careful that we, we don't do the same thing that, that these people Stephen is talking to right here. Go to verse 51. He's been harsh. He's going to get harsher. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Let's stop there for just a minute because you, you need to know what he's saying right here. See, see this terminology, stiff-necked people? Basically what he is saying to them in, at this point is, well, He's calling them a stubborn jackass, okay? We may have to, like, edit the tape here a little bit later, but that's exactly what he's doing. He's saying, this, this, this is what you're doing. You're like, like, a, like a donkey that refuses to be bridled, okay? That's offensive to a good Jewish person, but it's not as offensive as this one right here. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. Okay? Now, circumcision was a big deal for the Jewish people. It was a symbol of the covenant that they had with their relationship with God. And basically what he's saying right here is, hey, y'all, you're still a Gentile in everything about you but your private parts. And that's basically what he's saying. That, that, that's bad stuff. And here's why. Because you always resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's talking to you. The Holy Spirit's wanting to move. The Holy Spirit's wanting to convict you. The Holy Spirit's wanting to point you to God. But you just keep fighting it. You're resisting the Holy Spirit. And, and the effect of that, the consequence of that, is that you are, are, are spiritually blinded. Which, which brings us really to another theme right here. We talked about how when you're spiritually blind, that one of the things you do, we're going to come back to that in just a minute. Will you skip to this next point? Keep going, keep going, keep going. Right there. When you're spiritually blinded, you resist God. That's exactly what these people are doing. They're spiritually blinded. They're resisting the Holy Spirit, and it just caused them to keep resisting God. They're rejecting God. Like They, they, they just quit. They just keep doing this. They, 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 they're resisting. And Stephen said, quit, quit resisting what God is trying, trying to do in you. See, when you, we, when you rejected Jesus, you demonstrated the ultimate act of resisting God. That, that, that's that's what, what they're guilty of. That's truly what they're guilty of right here. God sent him, and you just couldn't see it. You, you couldn't see what was going on. It, God gave him to you, and you refused to believe it. In fact, look at verse 54. This is when it gets really interesting. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. And you got to go, what is all this drama about? What, what, what's the big deal? What, like what would cause you, besides maybe a two-year-old, to be furious and to gnash your teeth at something, right? This is what's going on. Why, 
Well, the reason is they were, they were fearful. Because they were afraid, they would not accept Jesus because he didn't fit into their worldview. He didn't fit into what they thought. They were scared of losing control. They were scared of change. They were scared of accepting something different. And so they just rejected Jesus. They refused to have anything to do with him. They were unwilling to hear someone confront their blindness. Just didn't fit into what they wanted to do, and they refused to see it. That spiritual blindness. And you know what? Fear, fear continues to do that work. Fear continues to keep people from giving their life to Jesus. It causes people to resist. It causes people to say things like, well, I didn't grow up that way. I didn't grow up like that. It doesn't seem possible to me. Well, I, I, I don't want to change my lifestyle or the things that I do. What will my friends, what will my family think about me? It's all a part of resisting the Holy Spirit, resisting God, being spiritually blind. And I just can't get out of the worldview that I have that even Jesus confronts with me. So things get worse, verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That's interesting, isn't it? Stephen here, who just is a few moments from dying and has just presented this incredible message, begins to see the response of people to it, and all of a sudden he, he begins to see things differently. He, he, begins, he begins to, to, uh, to, in essence, see God and see heaven, Right? While all the Jewish leaders are fearful, Stephen's fearless. He has a completely different perspective on everything. Verse 57. At this, Stephen's saying, look, I see Jesus at the right hand of God. Well, the Jewish leaders, they, they lost it. They covered their ears. They're yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Stephen's going to die because he, he questioned their blindness and their resistance of God. And they drag him out of the city and they stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. By the way, our first introduction of this man, his name is Saul right now, but we get to Acts chapter 9. His name becomes Paul. He becomes Paul the apostle eventually, and he is instrumental in taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. But right here, he is the one who is approving he is the one, in fact, that is watching over. He is supervising the stoning and death of Stephen. And that's, that's amazing that God's going to take that person and use him to become instrumental, right? Look at that next verse, verse 59. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That sounds kind of familiar. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. That sounds a little familiar. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That was just kind of a Jewish way of saying that right now he dies. Yet Stephen, through this whole thing, he faces death courageously. And not only did his message point to Jesus and ultimately them rejecting Jesus, even how he dies points to Jesus. I mean, even those words that he used point to him. He gave up his spirit. Jesus, you know, we're told he gave up his spirit. Uh, Stephen, uh, don't hold this against them. Jesus, Lord, for, uh, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. A similar kind of terminology. E even, their, even the way that they died. Uh, there was this unjust mob, angry mob. There was this unjust trial. All of these things just show Stephen how, how, how close he is to to Jesus. My question for you is what allows somebody to face death in this way, especially a death so tragic, traumatic like this? What, what would allow somebody to face it like that? 
I mean, we're, we're, we're all going to have to face death sometime. Some of us know a little further in advance than others when that's going to happen, but we're all going to have to face death. I, I want to be like Stephen. I, I don't want to be afraid. I, I want to face it that way. What causes somebody to, to go through that difficulty in that way? Well, certainly it's an absolute trust in God. But there's also a closeness of the Holy Spirit. Stephen was so filled with the Holy Spirit that we just continue to see this part. It's one of the first things that we read about him, full of faith, full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit. And, and here he is now facing uh, uh, death courageously, but it allowed him to live life courageously, boldly. He wasn't intimida- intimidated by religious bullies. It, it empowered him to, to speak boldly. I mean, this guy was fearless. It it enabled him to to forgive even in difficult circumstances that that ultimately result in his death. It's because Stephen, through the Holy Spirit, was able to see things differently. See, Stephen went through life spiritually, eyes wide open. He invited the presence of the Holy Spirit. He saw life from this heavenly perspective. In fact, we just read it. It was like he was in heaven, wasn't it? I see God. I see Jesus at the right hand of God. He was so close to the will of God. He was so in tune to the presence of the Holy Spirit that he could, in essence, see God. It absolutely changed his view of what was happening to him. He wasn't, he wasn't looking at the circumstances around him. He was looking at the bigger picture, the bigger view. Listen, if, if this world, this life, if it's everything to you, then your life will be eventual loss. It's, it's going to be gone someday. You're going to get older. When you get older, there's loss. You lose your, your youth, right? It's loss. You got friends and you got family members that die. You lose loved ones. It's, it's loss. Maybe you got a terminal condition and, and you're losing what you know. And it's a loss to you. But when you're focused on heaven... When that's your perspective, then nothing's lost. It's a different picture. In fact, let's just kind of wrap it up saying this. The Holy Spirit helps you open your eyes and to see clearly. You don't have the spiritual blindness. It causes you to restrict God or to to reject God, resist God. You, you, You go, again, eyes wide open. He gives you a heavenly perspective, not just a temporal view, not just an earthly view of things. That's why it's so important to read your Bible. Listen, it's not about you knowing more. It's about you becoming in tune with the very will of God, the Holy Spirit revealing things that you need to know and to believe and to learn and to obey from that. It's not just you knowing more. It's about you being in tune with with Jesus. What's the Holy Spirit trying to teach me through this? That's what he does. He reveals things. He reveals the Word of God, Jesus himself, as you open up the Word of God. And he begins to open our eyes up to opportunities. And here Stephen was so surrendered to the Holy Spirit in his life, so full of the Holy Spirit that his vision was absolutely crystal clear. And when you see clearly, when you have Holy Spirit vision, you're, you're not afraid. You're not afraid to die. You may not know all the answers. You may ha- have some kind of anxiety, but you're not afraid of that. You can be bold and courageous. You, 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 can, you can share Jesus with people. Stephen could see clearly, and it changed the way that he lived, and it changed the way that he died. So my wife and I took a trip. It's been almost two months ago. 
We'd stayed at an all-inclusive resort in the Dominican Republic back in early February. It's one of those trips that was not planned for us. We wanted to do something of that variety, and we got invited by some old, old friends, and we decided to go along with them. And, uh, man, it was fun. It, what a great time flying to another place where you don't have to worry about anything. We ate amazing food. We got sun sitting next to the pool. We got sun sitting next to the beach. We got in the water. We relaxed. We visited and got reacquainted with old friends. It was such a great time. I came back rested, relaxed. But you know what? The first few minutes of the trip weren't that way. You know why? Because we had to get up like at 4 o'clock in the morning. Nobody likes to do that to go catch a flight, right? And, you know, flying these days, what a pain it is to do that. I've been resisting flying because I don't want to have to deal with somebody else's schedule and somebody else's mismanagement of their schedule, right? And so we get up early, early, early uh, to do that. You know what? I get in the TSA line, the security line, and I get through there, and I get picked on every time. I don't know what it is, but... uh, Let me just say that once I went through the little radar thing that checks your x-ray thing, whatever that is, um, they, um, yeah, they took something from me. (laughs) Can I just say that? It didn't make it onto the airplane. Sir, you can go take that back to the car or you can give it up here right now. And I looked at the line and I said, yeah, you can have it. Okay. So that happened. We, we get to, we get to uh, Charlotte. This is our, uh, you know, layover flight, uh, layover place. We're there, and uh, we got plenty of time. And we're having this nice leisurely meal, and all of a sudden, uh, final call for flight number, and it's our flight. And we're like, wait, what? It's not time. And, you know, then you get rushed, and you get anxious, and you're like, we got we to go. We got to go find our flight. And we made our flight fine. But while we're sitting there getting on the plane, then our friends call us like, hey, we missed our flight. We won't see you today. It'll be tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this, this trip, this is turning out to be no fun. I'm not enjoying this trip. I'm thinking, what, what are we going to do? What, how, what? Now, here, here's what I have to do. How do I evaluate my vacation? Do I evaluate this vacation based upon the first few minutes of this trip? Or do I evaluate my vacation based on the entirety of the trip? Well, of course, I look back and go, we had a great time. I've hardly told anybody about the stuff that was difficult on the way down there. We had a great time on this trip. So listen to this. According to God... Our life on this earth is just a few minutes compared to the vacation that he's promised. It's just a few minutes. we we got to stop looking at the first few minutes of it. This life is just the first few minutes. It's just a dot on the line. But honestly, sometimes this, this, this life on earth it can be pretty rough. The first few minutes can be pretty rough. For a guy like Stephen, it was really rough. And that's where all of us are right now. Maybe maybe your gaze has been too focused on this life, on the first few minutes. And maybe, maybe you just need a change of perspective, like Stephen, to live your dot those first few minutes with eternity in mind. Hey, last verse. We're going to skip right into chapter 8 because something amazing right here happens. After Stephen dies, it says, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. We're going to get into this when we come back to Acts. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout. Oh, these are big words right here. Judea and Samaria. Why is that so significant? Because in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, you guys are going to be my witnesses. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And you'll be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
And what Stephen doesn't know before he dies is that because of his death, because, because he's martyred, the Jewish establishment is like, we're going to just move ahead and we're going to snuff out this Christianity problem. But instead, what's going to happen is it is going to spontaneously expand the name of Jesus and his church to the known world. They're going to begin to persecute Christians. It's just going to scatter them, and Jesus is going to be known throughout the entire world. Man, that's, that's a different look at things, that God can take things, terrible things, and absolutely turn them around for his good. Listen, don't, don't have such a limited view that you look at this world and you see all the negative and you see all the bad and you see all the stuff and you get so caught up in there. Make sure you're inviting the Holy Spirit to help you see things clearly you've got a heavenly perspective that you've got a godly perspective you've got an eternal perspective of things don't get so caught up in the temporal stuff and in the mess of the world and miss what God is doing father thank you for teaching us today from this passage and father we're so grateful for somebody like Stephen somebody who just absolutely gave everything not just because he believed in your son Jesus but because he obeyed he was obedient. He, he was a witness for him, just like, just like Jesus told him to do. And so, Father, I'm, I'm praying right now, praying right now for Christians, for non-Christians, for people that are struggling to, to see things clearly, for people that have doubts, for people that are uncertain about who Jesus is. I'm praying, God, that you will begin to open eyes up. Your Holy Spirit began to move today and help us to see things as they really are, not the way the world paints them. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.